microphone is will be in the center aisle. And uh, please go to the microphone if you have a question or when you have a question and uh, tell us your name and then the question or comment. Hi, Rutledge from MIT. I have several questions, but I'll try to keep them short. Let me start with the carbon nanotubes. <clears throat> are you seeing any secondary toxicity issues due to the metals, or are you removing the metals of the nanotubes? We've been working with our I'm sorry. We've been working with our supplier to remove as much of the metals as possible, um, and we actually have a collaboration going to make it a, a CGMP-compliant process so that the carbon nanotubes would indeed be approved by the FDA. Um, our studies have been very short-term, so we, we, we really don't have any long-term results on what the, the metals might do, but so far, no toxicity. And, and have you done that in zebra fish yet? No, sure haven't, but okay. that might be an excellent model system, okay. I guess. Um, just, a, just another question for some of the other members. Um, you were showing uh, a shift in absorption as well as emission of signal. Are you able to go ahead and use first order and second order harmonics in order to go ahead and use that as an amplifier, much like you would see a, a wave build up? So mm -hmm. what will happen is you'll have a fast wave and then a slow wave, mm -hmm. and they'll build up and you'll get larger waves, basically, that would shift the frequency? We haven't done that. <clears throat> we, we've basically um, taken it up to 600 to 800 power wattage and left it um, anywhere from 30 seconds to two minutes, and it's been very effective for us. So we haven't done that kind of a harmonic shift. Mm -hmm. um, one thing I would like to say, though, is we, we chose not to pursue the near IR mechanism of heating the carbon nanotubes um, because a lot of the tumors that we want to treat are deep tissue tumors. And near IR light may penetrate a couple of centimeters beneath the dermis, and then you, you don't get the effect of heating, at least for the carbon nanotubes. Um, so I know that's unrelated to your question, but I did want to throw that in. That's fine. The other guys, about harmonic effects and the different thicknesses of coatings? I don't think it'll have any effect on the nanoshells. No. And the donuts? Uh, don't know about that. Probably not. Okay. You need to be right on frequency. Thank you. Next question. Two questions. First, uh, quickly about the carbon nanotubes. Have you made any of those magnetic by putting magnetic nanoparticles inside? No, it... no, we haven't. Um, it's just we, we're limited resources. That has come across our minds, but we haven't done that yet. Because then you'd have also an MRI contrast agent. Exactly. Uh, question for, for Dr. Uh, Lee um, about your hydrogels on the surface of those gold nanoshells. Um, what does that do to the surface plasmon resonance uh, detection of the gold nanoshells? Uh, it doesn't shift the plasmon resonance in any way. Uh, it it will uh, because there is can a scattering can occur from the surface of the hydrogel mm -hmm. so uh, you can get a reduced uh, input of light to the uh, nanoparticle surface but typically for the lasers that we're using and you can see from the modulation yeah. experiments that we've done uh, we can uh, supply enough energy to to certainly raise the temperature a few degrees just in the simplest so process. even so even with fairly thick hydrogels you can still get surface uh, plasma we, we doubt that that's going to be a problem particularly mm -hmm. in the near infrared so mm -hmm. the studies that we showed here were actually on resonance at 530 mm -hmm. where a lot of scattering can occur but in the mm -hmm. near infrared it's not going to be uh, nearly as a big a problem okay thank you other questions, please. Yes, I'm um, Philip Rashong from University of Maryland for Dr. Dogovich. Can you actually do coupled assays since you can get RNAs in to DNA pieces to turn off the DNA using small interference? Um, I'd like to say yes, but we haven't tried that. Um, I think that is the idea is how, how can you start using perhaps non-natural or engineered control mechanisms to turn on and off gene expression. And RNA-based techniques are, are certainly very doable either at the uh, transcription level or the translation level. I'm sure you're familiar with a number of ways to do that as well. Uh, as well as even electronic on-off mechanisms using controlled inhibitors. They're all in the design plans um, 
for those of you who don't do fabrication, it is kind of challenging. Once you do make the structures, you're cranking them out on the wafer scale, which is great, but that's basically where we're at. Um, I'd uh, like to ask uh, Dr. Burgess how um, much of these nanotubes you can make. Um, as you know, one of these way out projects in this in uh, space is uh, to build a space elevator, mm -hmm. and the and it's going to be at an orbit of about five six hundred miles above the south uh, west Pacific. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and nanotubes are one of the possibilities for the uh, change. Mm -hmm. The the carbon nanotubes, um, we get them in, in gram quantities from the manufacturer, right. and yeah. it's really, I mean, there's two methods for making them. There's laser desorption, there's chemical deposition, and either method is effective. Um, the multi-wall nanotubes have imperfections in them, um, but they're very reasonably priced, whereas the single-wall nanotubes um, don't have those, those nicks in the, in the uh, constructs, but they're much more expensive. But for most um, applied materials applications, the multi-wall are just fine. Is it uh, within uh, imagination that you could make miles and miles of this stuff? I, I think theoretically, yeah. I mean, I, I'm thinking on the micro scale, but possibly. <laughs> the um, another comment is uh, much of what uh, we've uh, heard uh, in this session. Uh, and, and dealing with cancer therapy it has to do with what is the standard model for cancer therapy that is killing cancer cells. Now that unfor unfortunately is not a totally successful approach uh, and hence the great difficulty in treating many cancers. So essentially everything we've heard about cancer therapy is directed towards that goal which is the general goal in uh, oncologists. But there may be other methods of dealing with cancer, and I discussed one today for a certain percent, uh, yesterday rather, for a certain percentage of cancers, uh, antiviral treatment uh, appears to be a, a treatment that, uh, and a totally different approach uh, might be needed for that, for example, targeted antivirals. Mm -hmm. So I, I just mentioned that as, uh, I think, something that we'll be developing in the future. And uh, Dr. Molnar, um, you mentioned, uh, talked about uh, 3D studies of cells. And I think this has come up in several of the other talks as, as well, that uh, uh, much of the uh, research is uh, trying to see the effect of of, uh, of entry into cells and ther therapy directed towards the cells uh, requires two-dimensional tissue cultures that are on surfaces. Now, one of the features of doing experiments in near uh, uh, zero gravity is that you have three-dimensional accumulation of cells. And that much more reflects what actually goes on in the body. And this, this very important um, uh, structural uh, uh, barrier, you might say, to, to uh, having a natural accumulation of cells that can be eliminated in space. However, unless things go uh, until the space labs are completed, or, and there's a, a crew of six or so up in the European lab and Japanese lab and the US lab, that'll be a while. There, there is a device that was developed uh, at the National Institutes of Health and by NASA, the rotating wall vessel. Uh, which, in which, in effect, you uh, rotate uh, the medium in which the cells are contained, and you get a th uh, something like a zero-gravity third-dimensional effect. Now, these things are widely available. Uh, I, I think widely is probably not the right term, but they, they are used uh, a lot at NIH and elsewhere, and that's a consideration. The, these are quite uh, practical uh, uh, applications. Uh, there, I think two of the speakers uh, spoke about um, uh, the uh, generation of power uh, using solar power or other sources. Uh, I wonder if we could hear a bit more about that. 
Well, w with the nanoshells, because uh, you can access wavelengths of light ranging from uh, the ultraviolet all the way through the near infrared, basically you encompass the entire range of solar spectrum that reaches the surface of the Earth. So these nanoparticles are very efficient gatherers of light, and they convert that light into heat. And so you can use, in theory, you can build solar cells out of these nanoshell particles and use that as a, a way of, of capturing heat and converting that into uh, energy, usable energy. Uh, to be by heating uh, water or another fluid and driving exactly. a turbine. Exactly, right. Uh, is, does that actually happen? Uh, are we doing experiments along those lines? Sure. We're investigating that. That We're trying to make solar cells out of that for the exact purpose of energy conversion. Uh, I, I was very, uh, you know, that uh, quantitative information that Dr. Dacowitz uh, gave on the crowding of the cell was really fascinating. You know, until you, until you uh, look at the numbers, uh, as you did, and look at volume and molecule size, uh, it, it's, uh, it's easy, to, you, get, you really get the idea of the close packing and the, uh, the great possibility of encounter uh, uh, between them. And, and, it, and it's in a totally dynamic situation. Uh, has anybody done uh, the kind of frequency counts on, on uh, the um, probability of these encounters? Yeah. No. I mean, I, I think cell crowding is probably getting increasingly recognized, although it's been around for a while. Having experimental systems that test it has been a little more challenging. Typically what people do is they'll add polyethylene glycols or other solutions and, and redo the reactions. In our own experiments, we've been taking synthetically crowded structures by forests of carbon fibers or forests of other structures. And what we'll do is we'll run Monte Carlo-based simulations and correlate what we see experimentally. And so to basically estimate diffusion across these membranes or transport within a forest of these, um, we can accurately, we, we get the experimental data and then we fit that back to the, um, um, to the Monte Carlo simulations. And we can tell you exactly how many times it encounters in different spots. And now what we do in parallel with this in other funded efforts in our lab is we do the same experiments on E. coli cells. And we've developed systems where we could positionally localize proteins of interest. And second proteins of interest would be fluorescently labeled. And we use that to, and again, we do the Monte Carlo simulations and, and the bleaching, et cetera. And we could basically pull out from that the protein-protein interaction strength as well as the anomalous diffusion coefficients and how long it resides in these areas. But crowding, basically, if you're stuck in this environment, the, the other slides I'll use by analogy is like a poster session. If you ever had a crowded poster session at a scientific conference, they're organized in a certain way that you're going to get certain people to keep communicating. And they're crowded enough that you're stuck reading posters you may not have wanted to. And that's very much of how information exchange undoubtedly occurs in biological systems. And oftentimes there's catalysts around other than water to help kind of facilitate this exchange of information and energy and materials. And undoubtedly cells are organized in very similar ways. And I think the more evolved the cell system is, such as eukaryotic cells, et cetera, it's taken to another degree of organization. And even bacterial cells, they've been long thought to just be bags of goo, but, but they have cytoskeletal structures themselves. They're organized in distinct ways. It's been demonstrated that RNA expression often can occur in the region where it's needed in the cell, et cetera. Well, thank you. Are there uh, one further question? One quick question for Mitch, following up on, on your modeling. Obviously, these uh, models of synthetic biology are useful for understanding cellular behavior, but it also begs the uh, uh, possibility of trying to make uh, synthetic cells of very limited and very specific function yes. that might be highly efficient. And, and we've talked about that previously in the conference for possibly keeping um, things oxygenated while blood is not as for example, but there's many other possible functions. So is there an active program in terms of designing syn synthetic cells, if you will, for, for limited use? Uh, I, mean, I wish we could say active, of course. I mean, a lot of what I'll present here, I can't really write in an NIH grant. 
and, and it's it's hard to, to do this stuff and have people appreciate or understand. I think this meeting is kind of unusual that way. But um, some of the things we've been trying to get funded are reaction systems for energy transduction. For example, biomass. How do you take biomass and turn it into ethanol or something else? A lot of these processes are carried out by communities of bacteria or by systems which we really don't understand yet. And of course, they're mutually exclusive in a single organism. But in a synthetic system, you don't have that concern. And I think one of the things we realize when we do this designing point of view is that when you do metabolic engineering in live organisms, those cells are not here to do your bidding. They're here to survive. And so hence, when you try to get them to run a process, it's often deadly to the cell. And I think in a synthetic environment, we wouldn't have that concern. Obviously, we've got a lot of things to figure out, but I think that's one of the dreams in the long run. Why couldn't you use that in an NIH bank? <laughs> <laughs> so I'm on the biogenerating panel, and I've seen the proposals come in, and I understand the comments that come back. Um, I think we've been funded by the NIH for the last uh, six years, or certainly three more to go before another renewal has to take place. And I think we got fortunate with just the right round of reviewers who appreciated a very different approach to sensing and actuation using cell mimetics as opposed to classical electrochemical and other techniques. If there are no further questions, we can uh, have coffee here. And when should we come back? 15 minutes? 15? Okay, so I make it uh, 1024.